Hey, Scott Machine Gun Dad, welcome back to my channel. This is part two on the Thompson uh, documentary. If you watched part one, I hope you enjoyed it. Hopefully you'll watch part two. Um, as I said, the firing is at the end of this part. It sounds off a little bit because it's a copy of a copy that's uploaded on my computer, blah, 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 blah. Um, but we all know that a Thompson, if used properly, will remove the fingerprints. Again, thanks for coming to the channel. Please enjoy the documentary of the Thompson's performance on the battlefield. But soon, stories of its deadliness and reliability came from every theater of World War II. Earlier in the war, it was still looked upon as a criminal's weapon. Hitler had this leaflet dropped by the thousands as propaganda in an attempt to prove Churchill was indeed a gangster. Well, the world was soon to find out it wasn't a gangster gun. The Thompson submachine gun was a weapon of choice of men fighting for freedom all over the globe. The Thompson became a symbol of right, not wrong. It was a symbol of strength and power. And it was as American as apple pie and Chevrolet. As an advertising tool, the Thompson proved it could stir patriotism, glamorize jungle fighting, and make a buck. As a recruiting tool, the Thompson was without equal. Who could resist joining an outfit that had Tommy guns for you to use when the going got rough? And speaking of rough going, let's take a look at the Thompson in action as seen through the camera lens.
During the war, we loaned military equipment of all types to our allies. In some cases, this equipment was modified by a particular country to meet its military requirements. This is a model 1928 A1, manufactured by Savage, as we learned by the S prefix before the serial number. This is typical of the 1928 A1s that were sent to England during the Lend-Lease program. Now, the British had certain modifications that they wished to make on the guns, and uh, we're going to talk about those right now. The most obvious is the attachment of the sling swivels to the front foregrip and also to the top end of the buttstock. With the addition of the sling swivel on top of the buttstock, the location where the sling swivel was before has been filled in. The attachment of the sling swivel on the foregrip is quite interesting, but you, as you notice, this combination will enable the gun to be carried and slung over the shoulder and muzzled down. Evidently, that's the way that they prefer to carry it, or maybe even in an assault position. The buttstock was reinforced by the simple addition of two screws. This is a Savage gun with standard U.S. markings. Two inspector's marks are shown. One, GEG -E in a circle, stands for George Gohl, who is now Chief Inspector for all military production Thompsons. This 1928 A1 has a commercial style ejector. The actuator is also one of the commercial styles and displays the fine checkering. The cuts compensator is the third model as found on all M1928 A1s. The barrel has British proof marks indicating the caliber and the amount of pressure the gun was tested with, 7 tons. Tommy gun was inscribed on some guns to comply with regulations after the name was registered by auto ordinance. Another difference in this British modified 1928A1 is the finish itself. The finish is a black blue finish as opposed to the parkerized or matte blue finish on most 1928A1s. Between 1940 and 1943, both the Auto Ordnance Corporation and Savage Industries manufactured over 562,000 model 1928 A1s at a cost averaging $209 per gun. With the introduction of the British Sten gun and the German MP40, it was realized that a submachine gun that weighed 10 to 12 pounds and fired pistol cartridges really didn't need a compensator, and it certainly didn't need an expensive, finely machined rear sight that was adjustable to 600 meters. So with the twofold idea of both increasing the practicality of the gun as well as reducing the cost, the stage was set for the introduction of the next model of the Thompson series, the M1. Even though production shortcuts were taken, a soldier armed with the US model M1 still had one of the finest and most effective submachine guns ever built. With simplified production in mind, Savage approached auto ordnance with the idea of completely eliminating the bliss lock system. It was a very expensive proposition to manufacture, and their test had proven that it just simply wasn't needed with a 45 caliber pistol cartridge. Auto Ordnance didn't like this proposition because the Blish Lock was the heart of the Thompson gun since its inception. But experience had proven that there was no other submachine gun in the world that used a locking system similar to this, so they relinquished. The result was a lower priced weapon, the M1. It used a standard blowback system similar to every other machine gun that was now in production. The rear sight was one of the first major changes with this model. It was a simple bent leaf with protective ears. The fire control levers had been modified to simple steel rods. The only checkering that was evident was on the magazine catch. The compensator had not proven effective and was removed. The cooling fins were replaced by a thicker barrel this seemed to work just as well. Taking the idea from the British, the buttstock was reinforced and permanently attached to the receiver by screws. Consequently, there was no need for a stock latch assembly. Another major manufacturing difference was the elimination of the machining which allowed the use of the drum magazine. This was based on the fact that the drum magazine was just too unwieldy in actual combat circumstances. And so the 20 round magazine was discarded and the 30 round magazine was used to increase firepower. The next major difference 
was that the actuator or bolt handle and its slot was relocated to the right side of the receiver, and the receiver itself was made thinner. The familiar cocking handle on top was now gone. Internally, the bolt was nothing more than a slam fire bolt. It had completely eliminated the bliss lock system as shown in our diagram. In the model 1928A1, shown here cocked and locked, the bronze H-block is in the unlocked position. When the trigger is pulled, the sear depresses, releasing the bolt to be driven forward by the recoil spring. The bolt drives a cartridge from the magazine. Near the moment of chambering, the locking piece is now moved to a partially locked position. The hammer is still retracted and the firing pin does not protrude. Upon the final closing of the bolt, the H piece has finally locked itself into the receiver grooves. The hammer is pivoted forward, striking the firing pin and firing the chambered cartridge. Let's watch this action again. Partially locked, hammer back. Locked, hammer forward. This action will be repeated for as long as the trigger is held to the rear and as long as the magazine contains ammunition. When the trigger is released, the sear rises into position and catches the bolt, stopping the cycle. The 1921 bolt assembly used a thin one-piece actuator. This lightweight piece is one of the reasons for the gun's higher rate of fire. The 1928 Navy bolt assembly modified the 1921 actuator by adding a weight, thereby slowing the bolt and the rate of fire. The actuator actually consisted of two pieces. The 1928-1928A1 bolt used a one-piece actuator assembly in which the weight was integral with this part. The M1 bolt did away with the separate actuator completely. Even so, it retained the separate hammer in front of the bolt and the firing pin was still retractable. The M1A1 further simplified production by eliminating the hammer and replacing the firing pin and its spring with a fixed firing pin. So this inscription on the side of the receiver Thompson Submachine Gun, Caliber 45, M1A1, in actuality proved to be the epitaph of the Thompson series of guns. This was the last production model in World War II of the Thompson series. Even though this gun outperformed the original 1928A1 model and only cost $45, it still needed to be superseded by a cheaper, more effective, easily produced submachine gun. So, in 1942, the U.S. government opened up a series of tests to determine which gun would replace the Thompson. Auto Ordnance entered their new model, the T2 prototype. Auto Ordnance Corporation must have seen the writing on the wall when the demise of the Thompson submachine gun was predicted. So in 1942, they also entered a gun into the submachine gun trials. They called it the Thompson T2. Although the T2 was submitted by Auto Ordnance Corporation, it was designed by a man by the name of William Bennett of Los Angeles, California. This gun differed from most of the submachine guns submitted in the fact that it fired from a closed bolt. The rear side of this gun was simplified to a more practical type of sight with a flip-up leaf and a peep. The one-piece stock was made to protect the action from the environment as well as protecting the shooter's hands from burns. Wing nuts at the front and the rear of the stock held the stock into position. Other than the fact that this gun fired from a closed bolt position, which is unusual for a submachine gun, it also incorporated a two-stage trigger, eliminating the selector switch. The trigger was designed so that with a light pull, semi-automatic fire would be delivered, but a deliberate hard pull all the way to the rear would deliver full automatic fire. Even though this gun bore the name and address of the Auto Ordnance Corporation and the name Thompson Submachine Gun, in actuality, it was a total different design from the ground up from the original Thompson. 
The only thing it had in common was that it used the same box magazines. This is another T2 model. This particular one is a 9mm, and it varies in a number of significant ways from the original T2 in 45. Although the stock design is similar to the original, gone are the ugly wing nuts that held the stock to the receiver. Replaced by a single sling swivel, which can be unscrewed to take the gun apart. The magazine looks like a standard Thompson magazine, but when it's removed, it is, an, it is evident that it is only a 9mm magazine and not a 45. This 9mm prototype retained the closed bolt operation of the original T2 45. Using the trigger to control fire was extended with the 9mm prototype. If the bottom portion of the trigger is pressed, it will fire only single shots. If the top portion of the trigger is pressed, it will fire full automatically. The T2 gun was designed with only 30 or 31 parts, so therefore it was cheap and easy to manufacture. At one time it was said that the cost could be less than $50 per gun, but its poor performance at the submachine gun trials led the government to drop it from further consideration. And it has been rumored that in all the model variations, 45 and 9 millimeter, there were only six T2s ever developed. And these are two of the remaining examples of those six guns. During the war, several tool room models were made up in different calibers and made of different materials. One of these experimental models had a receiver manufactured out of aluminum. This was obviously an attempt to lighten the weight of the gun. According to correspondence from Savage Arms Company, only 40 tool room models were made up. The lightweight receiver, however, wouldn't stand up to continued firing and virtually all were scrapped. This gun is one of only three known to exist today. Other than the color and type of metal, the gun was made exactly like a model 1928 Savage commercial gun. This handy looking firearm is an attempt to convince military authorities that the M1 or M2 carbine wasn't needed if you had a Thompson chambered for the 30 caliber carbine cartridge. Unfortunately, the light weight of the M1 carbine was what the Army was looking for, and the heavy Thompson, no matter how it was marked and chambered, still was not the answer. This sample was made specifically for the 15 round carbine magazine. It also was a straight blowback submachine gun and did away with the H block assembly. Very few were ever made, and then only as prototypes. But even so, we did find another 30 caliber carbine Thompson. This one was quite different. Obviously, this gun is not a production model, and just a few guns were made in the 30 caliber carbine cartridge. This particular gun had a modified magazine that was put into it, still left bright, not blued. Also, you notice that it is not cut for the drum magazine. Barrel was marked 30 caliber carbine. Other than these changes, from here on back, the gun essentially remains a Thompson submachine gun in all respects. I had to move the receiver of the gun way out of the picture so you could see how long the barrel was on this particular gun. This is probably one of the most interesting experimental Thompson guns ever built. The caliber of this gun is built in is 30 06. This gun is probably the oddest and rarest of all the experimental models of the Thompson guns. This gun utilizes a modified BAR magazine with the oil pads on the sides of the magazine, as were the earlier Thompson rifle. The cartridges still must be lubricated as this rifle is a blowback weapon. Yes, that's what I said, blowback, in a 30 6 rifle caliber. This is virtually unheard of in any military or firearms design circles but they made a few changes in this gun which made it seem possible. One of the ingenious devices invented for this rifle to get it to function with the 30 6 in a blowback mode was what I call the reciprocating friction bolt, which we can see by removing the magazine from this gun. As you can see there are spline cuts into the bolt extension. When the bolt is pulled to the rear, 
it is shown that the bolt face acts like a plunger when the cartridge is chambered. So, when the cartridge was chambered and the bolt plunger was pushed back into the bolt, it spread the bolt extension apart, which created friction within the chamber extension. In addition to using this unique novel approach, they increased the tension in the recoil spring enormously. This is strictly an experimental model and doesn't even have the rear side installed. As a student of firearms, I have to really wonder whether this firearm really works, whether it would be safe to shoot in the powerful 30 6 caliber or not. But the gun is too valuable to risk even that kind of experimentation. Because, as mentioned right here on the side of the receiver, this gun is an experimental gun made in 1943. Even though this is the only 30 6 Thompson in existence as far as we know, it still stands today as an example of Auto Ordnance's dedication to provide a full caliber automatic rifle based on a simple locking mechanism. This Thompson submachine gun is a true enigma. The upper receiver and the lower grip frame, as well as all the internal parts, are manufactured out of stainless steel. The Thompson logo can be seen on two locations, the bottom of the grip frame and in the usual place on top of the receiver. The address stamped on the right side of the gun is the Bridgeport, Connecticut address. On the left side of the receiver is the model designation and the serial number. Model M1A2, serial number 2. A little back from the model ID is the additional mark of the U.S. Navy, making sense of the stainless steel construction. Notice that the barrel remains a standard blue M1A1 barrel. This, in combination with the stainless body, make this an exceptionally beautiful Thompson. This gun has never been described before, and as far as we know, this is the only one of its kind in existence. Six were said to be manufactured, or partly so, and no one knows where the others may be. This is number two. Where's number one? In 1951, Newmarch Arms Corporation bought out auto ordnance and started to assemble Thompsons from leftover parts. A few of the guns were sold to qualified buyers. In later years, they started manufacturing their own Thompson submachine gun, a version of the 1928A1 from scratch. The markings on these newer guns were different than any other. For example, U.S. Model 1928 and caliber 45 M1. The fire controls were built using the style from the later war guns, simple steel rods. Internally, this gun still featured the Blish locking system. Other external differences are the cooling fins are very thick and squared off. The actuator knob is very plain and smooth. Another sure identification characteristic is the address on the side of the gun. West Hurley, New York was the location of numerous charms. This is a very interesting variation of the Thompson submachine gun. It is in 22 caliber. It is manufactured by the numerous charms corporation of West Hurley, New York and it has several major design differences between it and the original Thompson submachine gun series. The receiver is marked A22, which identifies this as a 22 caliber model. The caliber 22 stamping is also underneath the Thompson ID. The rear sight is very unusual, a standard Williams peep sight. The actuator is very tall, and the bolt looks like that of a sporting rifle. Internally, the gun is very similar to the original Thompson design. The grip frame is virtually identical, along with the trigger and control mechanisms. But the bolt is a simple blowback bolt and has no locking system of any kind because the cartridge is a low-powered 22 caliber. Rimfire Productions' classic series of tapes are produced in conjunction with the William Douglas Military Museum. Mr. Douglas is a military firearms historian and a renowned collector of Class III military and police equipment. A lot of people are confused about how you can legally own machine guns and silencers and sawed-off shotguns and those types of uh, items. And uh, really back in the 20s and the 30s, when the gangsters and all those types of um, uh, Al Capone era things were going on, there was no requirements or regulations for owning machine guns. And at that time, you could go into a hardware store in, uh, say, Chicago 
and you had to register a handgun if you bought it in there. But you could walk out with a brand new Thompson machine gun. $175 price tag, and you could take it right with you. Because of some of the uh, strike breaking attempts by the management of textile mills and coal companies, and because of the use by gangsters of both sawed off shotguns and Thompsons and other automatic weapons, the uh, Congress decided to ban the private ownership of machine guns in the United States. But the Attorney General, kind of the um, legal advisor to the United States, to Congress as their attorney, said you cannot ban uh, any type of firearm. You can regulate it through taxing. You can control it and regulate it. So Congress passed the 1934 Firearms Act, which did just that. The price of the gun being around 175 to 200 dollars, they put a transfer tax of 200 dollars on it. So each time a machine gun was transferred from one individual to another, you had to pay a 200 dollar transfer tax. That included silencers, uh, sawed-off shotguns, short barrel rifles. In November of 1968, the federal government held a 30-day amnesty period in which citizens in the United States could register certain firearms that they uh, had not registered during the previous 50-some years that the uh, NFA law of 1934 had been in effect. A lot of collectors and dealers over the years since the 1968 amnesty have believed there would be a second amnesty where guns that weren't registered the first time around could be put on the books. I personally don't believe this is ever going to happen. In fact, in May of 1986, Congress passed some additional gun legislation, part of which affected machine guns. Any machine gun made after May of 1986, whether in this country or imported from outside the United States, cannot be transferred to an individual. It can be transferred to dealers, but only as sales samples for law enforcement sales. So we've established that you can own machine guns if they're made prior to May of 1986. There are certain requirements you have to go through. There's a form that you fill out. The dealer or the seller usually gives you that form. It's called a Form 4 under the BATF guidelines. If you fill that form out, get a set of fingerprint cards, some photographs, and go to your local law enforcement officer for the sign-off. That's what we call it. It's a law enforcement certification on the Form 4. If he signs that form, then he knows of no reason why the possession of this machine gun would violate state or local laws and knows of no reason why you would use it for other than lawful activities and your fingerprints and photographs and background check clear, you can become the owner of that machine gun. Okay, let's say you passed all the legal requirements for owning a machine gun, and you want to go out and buy yourself a Thompson. What model Thompson should you purchase? If you want one just as a shooter, it's rather easy. You buy one that's safe and reliable and does what it's supposed to do when you pull the trigger. If you want one that holds its value over the years and becomes an investment, you want to look at some rather important criteria. One is the condition of the firearm as to its original finish, original parts, and that it hasn't been abused or marred in any way. Gun number 167, a Colt 21A, meets all the criteria one should look for in purchasing a collectible Thompson. It still retains almost 100% of the original blue finish applied by the Colt factory over 70 years ago. The wood looks brand new, no dents or scratches, and all parts in this gun are original, including the accessories it was shipped with. Its documentation from original purchaser to its current owner, along with a three-digit serial number, makes this Thompson a collectible in every sense of the word. In addition to the guns themselves, Thompson accessories, brochures, manuals, and related items have also achieved collectible status. So you don't have to own a gun to be a Thompson collector. Many Thompson accessories have become very collectible, such as these two hard cases here. Externally, the only difference between these two cases is that the FBI case on the left has leather corners and no end latches. This is the interior of a typical FBI hard case. The gun could be dismounted with the buttstock put inside the case, a drum, and four sticks. There was also a cleaning rod and a place in the lid for the spare parts kit. The major difference between the police case and FBI hard case is on the inside. The police hard case put the drum and stick mags at opposite ends and the buttstock between them. This was done to balance the weight when carrying 130 rounds of ammo the drum and stick mags held. The Indiana hard case is perhaps one of the rarest items known to the collector of Thompson accessories. This particular case was the personal property of George Gall and documented as used by him when traveling as a sales rep for the auto ordnance company. We've probably all seen old movies and TV programs such as The Untouchables showing gangsters carrying violin cases presumably holding a Thompson. A violin case, however, will not hold a Thompson with a vertical front grip. 
Only a Viola case is large enough to accept such a gun. Other collectible Thompson cases might include this small musical instrument case fitted for a miniature pewter Thompson cigarette lighter. A variety of other Thompson accessories, such as these drum and stick mag cases, provide the collector with unlimited material to research and document. Shown here are both commercial and military canvas cases for holding 20 round stick mags, 30 round stick mags, and the rare two cell pouch which holds a pair of 18 round shot cartridge mags. The 50 and 100 round drum carriers are also shown. Here are examples of canvas cases made for World War II military Thompsons and a leather motorcycle scabbard dated 1944 manufactured by S. Froelich Company of New York City. The metal cleaning kit with spare parts has always been a rare Thompson accessory to obtain, especially with original commercial Colt parts in it, such as the nickel steel firing pin and correct brushes and pull through thongs. And until a few years ago, it was virtually impossible to locate the canvas spare parts and cleaning kit. These items today bring prices four to five times higher than what collectors used to pay for the Colt guns themselves. The nickel oil can shipped in the buttstock of each Colt Thompson, along with the brass cleaning rods just mentioned, are other Tommy gun accessories now disappearing into private collections. I made two toy wooden Thompson guns when I was nine years old. One has no buttstock and takes a drum. The other was two-tone and had a stick magazine and compensator. Store-bought toy Thompsons were fun, too. These guns were made by Marks and Company in the 1940s and 50s. Collectors of sporting arms have commemorative models to choose from, and this is a commemorative for the Thompson Collector, a numeric, full-auto, World War II commemorative. This gun was a limited production model, and only 750 guns were manufactured. The compensator is gold-plated and marked with the Thompson logo. The sling swivels are also plated as is the actuator assembly. The expensive Lyman rear sight really looks rich now. The buttstock is tastefully inset with a U.S. medallion and another medallion honors World War II vets. Yes, a commemorative Thompson. Unfortunately, no more will ever be available due to the 1986 gun law banning additional manufacture of new machine guns. Before we jump right into the disassembly and assembly of the Thompson gun, there's a few things I need to talk to you about. Number one is safety. You must realize that the Thompson gun fires from an open bolt. What this means is that when the bolt is pulled back, if there is a loaded magazine inserted into the gun, whenever this bolt goes forward, for whatever reason, it will fire a cartridge. So you must be aware of that. To make the Thompson gun safe, the Thompson gun isn't considered safe until the magazine is completely removed from the gun. I can't stress safety enough. Remember, the Thompson gun to be unloaded must have the magazine removed, the bolt forward. There are two types of disassembly for the Thompson submachine gun. The first is the feel strip. The second is the detail strip. Right now we're going to concern ourselves with feel stripping. I want to make a point very clear. All Thompson submachine guns are collectible, highly valued firearms. Their value drops considerably if they are marred or scratched or broken in any way. You must always keep this in mind whenever disassembling or cleaning a Thompson submachine gun. More guns of high value are ruined because of improper cleaning and disassembling techniques than there ever will be by shooting them. Before starting field disassembly of the Thompson gun, make sure that the magazine has been removed and the actuator and bolt is in the forward position. Point the gun away from you, pull the actuator back and visually check the chamber to make sure a cartridge is not in there. This can happen. Let the bolt go all the way forward. At the front end of the buttstock, you'll see a latch. Depress the latch with your finger, pull the buttstock off to the rear, lay the buttstock down to the side. After the stock has been removed, 
take the firearm and turn it upside down on the table as such. At the end of the receiver, you'll see the takedown latch or takedown button. This button is spring-loaded. If you can push it down with your fingers, fine. If not, you can use a tool such as a screwdriver. We're going to depress the latch as such, making sure at this point that the rocker is set on full automatic and the gun is set on fire with the takedown plunger depressed, we're going to start the grip frame slightly to the rear by tapping slightly on the front till it holds down the plunger. Continue the grip frame to the rear by slightly tapping it until it breaks free, loose. At this point, you're going to reach in with your finger, grab the trigger and depress it. And at the same time, you're going to slide the grip frame off the bottom of the receiver. It should come off without forcing without using any tools. At the moment, we're going to take the grip frame and place it out of the way. At the end of the receiver, we see where the buffer goes through the rear of the receiver and the buffer pilot extends through the rear receiver. It can be depressed with the finger as such. At this point, we take the receiver and we point it away from us. By depressing the buffer pilot through the rear of the receiver, we can grab the buffer through the rear with this finger and pull it free. Keeping it under pressure because the spring pressure is very tight, we can release it from the gun as such and can be pulled from the rear of the bolt. At this point, the recoil spring can be removed from the buffer and buffer pilot, and the buffer can be separated into two pieces as such. At this point, the receiver can be moved to this position. The bolt can be pulled back, usually of its own accord. The bolt can be grabbed at the rear lifted out of the gun completely and removed. At this point, the bolt can be placed aside, and this will give us a look at the actuator and the blish lock. At this point, we can take the receiver in our left hand, put our middle finger on the rear end of the back of the actuator, sliding it up to this position, and holding the actuator into position with our little finger. We can then reach down and take the blish lock assembly straight out of the receiver. By pulling the actuator back so the actuator knob is lined up with the hole in the receiver, it can be lifted straight out of the gun. With the removal of the actuator, the gun is now field stripped and all parts can be cleaned and lubricated as needed. To start our assembly procedure, we place the receiver upside down in front of us. The actuator is the first part we install. The actuator knob goes forward and fits into the clearance hole in the top of the receiver. It is then slid forward. The H block is marked with the word up and an arrow. The arrow goes towards the muzzle and the word up faces you as you place it into the receiver bottom towards you. Held in this position, it is slid into the receiver and pushed down into the actuator, moving it slightly to the rear. The actuator and H-block assembly is then pushed to the rear of the receiver. The bolt is held in this position and inserted slightly tilted over the H-block and actuator. And then the complete bolt assembly is slid toward the front until the H-block is engaged. The buffer itself has a flat side. Remember to install this side down in the receiver or the buffer pilot cannot be set in place. Assemble the two pieces. The buffer and pilot can now be inserted into the recoil spring. The receiver is held in this position and the recoil spring assembly can now be slid into the rear of the bolt. Make sure that the flat part of the buffer is facing away from you at this point. The buffer is then compressed on the recoil spring and installed into the hole in the rear of the receiver where the buffer pilot will snap into position as such. Making sure that the buffer pilot extends to the rear of the receiver. Picking up the grip frame, we now have to make sure that the rocker pivot is on auto and the safety is in the fire position. Make sure of these settings. We then turn the grip frame over and use our thumb to pull the trigger all the way to the rear. While holding the trigger back, align the receiver rails with the ones on the grip frame 
and slide it all the way forward until the takedown catch snaps into position at the rear of the receiver. The gun is now assembled and ready to go. Before we start our loading and firing demonstrations, there are a few important points that I need to bring out about firing open bolt guns. The Thompson, as well as 90% of the other submachine guns that are out there, all fire from the open bolt system. When the bolt is pulled to the rear, it stays to the rear. If the bolt goes forward and there is a loaded magazine in the gun, the gun will fire, regardless of the reason that the bolt went forward, whether the trigger is pulled or whether it is jarred off the sear. It is important to remember that the Thompson, as well as any other open bolt submachine gun, is never considered unloaded unless the magazine is clear from the weapon. The fire controls on the Thompson are the safety selector. It can be pushed forward to either the fire position or pushed toward the rear in the safe position by simply rotating it as such. The second control is the rocker pivot, sometimes known as the selector switch. It can be pivoted from the full automatic position, which is the forward position, or the single shot position by pivoting it to the rear. We're going to return it back to the full automatic position. We're going to place the gun on safe with the bolt to the rear. This is the starting position for loading. Another point which is very important to bring up is have the gun checked by a competent gunsmith before you fire it. These guns are quite old, they're considered antiques. Make sure that your gunsmith just isn't somebody who can put recoil pads on a shotgun. He must understand the Thompson submachine gun system to be able to safely check the gun out. Whenever pulling the bolt back to the rear, a point I want to bring out is that you must pull it back to the second click so the sear will engage in the proper notch into the bolt. This is a 20 round Thompson box magazine. The follower is spring loaded and on top of the follower is a stop. This activates the trip which in turn holds the bolt back when the last round is fired out of the magazine in the Thompson. It is loaded by simply placing a cartridge on top of the follower and pushing with it down with the thumb. It will automatically snap underneath the feed lips. The next cartridge will go right on top of that one, pushed down the same way. The third one is done the same way, and so on. Now, the 30 round magazine is loaded identically. It too is a box magazine. There is no difference other than the length of the magazine that holds more cartridges. The two other magazines for the Thompson are the drum magazines. We have the 50 round magazine, commonly known as the L drum, and the 100 round drum magazine, commonly known as the C drum. This unit right here in the front of the magazine is called the key. This is used to wind the magazine and to put tension on the cartridges so they will feed. At the top of the magazine are where the feed lips are. This is where the cartridges come out one at a time. The method for loading this magazine is quite simple, but if it's not done properly, the gun will jam and will not feed. The first step is to lay the magazine on a flat surface so we can load it properly. If you look on the key, you will notice that a portion of the key right here is spring steel. It lifts up. This acts as the latch to the magazine. To open the magazine, what we need to do is steady the magazine, lift the spring lock up as such, then slide the key off in a straight direction in this method right here. The top then is lifted off of the bottom of the magazine. The front of the magazine is lifted off of the back of the magazine. Inside the magazine, you will notice fingers and spirals. The cartridges have to be placed between the fingers and along the spirals in this method. We'll show you how to do that right now. The first step to loading the drum magazine is to make sure that one of the feed fingers is slightly to the right of the feed lip. This will allow us to load five cartridges, one at a time, in the outer track, You should be able to fit five cartridges in between each finger. Continuing as such, we're going, going to load five cartridges in the next segment. We can then continue loading on the inside track after the outside spiral is filled. Again, placing five per segment. When all 50 cartridges are loaded, 
The magazine should look like this. Then the cover is replaced the same way that it came on. The front of the cover snaps over the rear of the cover. When the lid is placed on, you must pay particular attention to the locating stud right here. We now reinstall the key. If you noticed on the stud, there are two grooves cut to either side of it. Underside the key, you have a round hole for slipping over the stud and a groove for locking in the grooves. So the key is installed as such. It is placed over the stud. The, the spring-loaded catch is then lifted up as the key is slid onto the magazine, thus locking it into position. The 100-round drum magazine is loaded in a similar fashion to the 50-round magazine with these differences. The first spiral track between the finger and the loading mouth of the, of the magazine is loaded with only five cartridges, so you can push the fingers aside just to give you enough room to put five cartridges in the first segment. Then it can be rotated until the cartridge is pushed into the feed mouth. Then the cartridges are inserted six at a time in the outside track. You notice there are holes in the middle of each feed finger. Starting right here, we're going to place an extra cartridge right in there. When the 100 round drum is properly loaded, it should look like this. Six in each spiral track, one in these fingers, and five in the feed track. The cover is then placed back on top. Again, we want to be careful to make sure that the locating stud is in proper position. Depending upon the type of Thompson that you're shooting, the key is wound a certain amount of clicks to apply the proper amount of tension to the feed spirals. If you're shooting a 1928, 1928 A1 model or a 28 Navy overstamp, then what you need to do is to follow the instructions that are generally written on the front of the magazines and wind it only to nine clicks because of the slower cyclic rate of fire. If you're using this magazine in a 21 model, which has a higher rate of fire, you need to wind it 11 clicks. If you're not going to fire the gun immediately, you can apply the proper tension for storage on the magazine of only two clicks. Keep in mind how many that you have cranked it up, two clicks, and then add the additional clicks when you're ready to shoot. The 100 round drum has wound 15 clicks, as marked on the front of the drum. Since the first gun that we're going to fire is a Model 1921, the Champaign, Illinois Police Department gun, we're going to wind the drum 11 clicks because this is a Model 1921. One click, two clicks, three, four, and so on. Eleven clicks for the Model 21. And of course, the 100 round drum, remember we wind 15 clicks. We're set and ready to do some shooting. Let's go take a look at the Thompson in action. 